you grab your Bibles, we'll be in 1 Peter again today. We're continuing our series called Exiles as we study through the book of 1 Peter. It's a letter that Peter has written to, church, to churches, Christians in, uh, in the Roman Empire who are undergoing beginning, the beginnings of uh, persecution under the emperor Nero. I mean, intense, intense persecution. It's, it's beginning to amp up now. Peter senses it. He's in Rome. He calls it Babylon, which we'll talk about here in a bit, and he he speaks to the Christians in Rome. He reminds them, you are exiles. You are not of this world. You are not of Rome. You are of the kingdom of heaven. You don't belong here. So he reminds them of that, reminds them they are chosen ones. They've been elected. They're chosen by God and chosen for such a time as this. As we've studied throughout this, and we'll do so for another eight weeks or so, we have resources on our website. So if there are other ways that you wanna dig into the scripture, there are books, there are articles, there are a couple of classes, like online classes you can take. There's a reading plan. All that's on our website. Feel free to go there. I would encourage you to. Like anything that we do here on Sunday morning, uh, it's a gift that we get to do it. But if we don't do this Monday through Saturday, this is really means nothing. We can gather and we can huddle together, but if we don't go out and run the play, it doesn't matter that we've huddled together. And so I wanna encourage you uh, to do that. What I'm gonna do is I wanna read verses 13 through 25. And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk backwards through the passage. Because I think if we, the way that our minds work, I think we miss what's happening uh, reading it front to back. I wanna start at the end and then work our way backwards a bit. Uh, this morning just to help us understand, I hope, help us to understand uh, what Peter is saying. So let's just read this together. First Peter chapter one, we're gonna begin in verse 13 uh, and I'll read this out loud for us. Therefore, Peter says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for his sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails or falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Now, Peter, remember, Peter is a fisherman, and so Peter writes like a fisherman would write. Uh, Paul and his letters are just eloquent and they're full of scholarly wisdom. They're written well. Uh, Peter, no shade to Peter, but he's not what Paul is. A fisherman trying to write theology is gonna sound different than a theologian writing theology. So that's why in this, you're gonna, it, feel, it feels a lot like a sixth grade girl is telling you all about her day, isn't it? As you read this, like, I'm lost. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. And why do I care what she was wearing? It doesn't matter to me. But he's, this is how Peter is going to write. So I, what, again, I wanna walk us backwards through it hopefully to, to unpack what Peter is actually saying. Any, any of you here today play fantasy football? Anybody play fantasy football? Yeah. Yep. Good. All right, fantasy football. Uh, I play fantasy football. I have for a number of years. And um, I, sometimes I get way too into it, way more than I should be into fantasy football. And my wife, Meredith, makes fun of me because it's called fantasy football. And so she makes fun of me for playing a fake game. And uh, so, I mean, the group of guys that I've played with, we played with for years. They're from uh, when we were in Savannah, a bunch of guys from Savannah. And so uh, we play together. Some of them are way too into it, like way, way too into it. It's all they can talk about all the time. A few weeks ago, um, our fantasy football, our fake football league, the idea of fantasy football is this, that you pretend you're the commissioner or that you're the owner of a football team. And you draft from uh, today's football players and then you create a team. 
Then you decide which of those players is going to start. And then depending on how those players play in the game, your team gets points. And so what's happened is um, I no longer cheer for a team. I cheer for my team. So I don't care who wins on Sundays as long as my player gets amount of points and those types of things. But a few weeks ago, uh, our, my fantasy football league in Savannah that I'm part of decided they were going to do a mock fantasy draft, which is actually a fake, fake football draft is what that is. <laughs> That's what that is. So 10 grown men uh, get online together uh, to do this fake, fake football draft. But the players don't know if they're on our team. We know they're on our team. They have no idea. And so we've stalked them for a year throughout the preseason. And now, uh, now we get to choose them to be on our team. And so, uh, but we get really immersed in this fake football. To the point of where this mock draft, this fake, fake football draft, actually then um, the, what we use then creates this uh, like ranking system for how your fake, fake football draft went. And guys, in my fake fantasy, in my fake football league, are then declaring that they are the winners of the fake, fake football draft. That's just, that's, that's where we are today in society. That's where we are. That's where we've landed in society today. The problem, though, for many of us, and I'm gonna, we're going to study this in First Peter, is that many of us, we live in a fantasy world to begin with. The world that we live in is not the world that's actually happening today. And we get so distracted by fake things that are actually fake things of fake things that we miss the real thing that's happening right before our very eyes. Now, Peter writes this to a group of Christians, primarily Gentiles, so not Jewish Christians, in Roman provinces that have been burnt to the ground. Uh, chaos is ensuing, and they're about to enter into some dark, dark suffering. Again, the like of which we have never known in America, but our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan know all too well today. But he writes this letter to them to remind them that they are exiles because what's happened, what will happen and has happened for a lot of us is over time we forget that we're not from here, that we're from somewhere else. I grew up in Florida and I went to the University of Florida, which makes me a Gator fan. If you need to leave, that's fine. You're more than welcome at this point to leave. A few years ago, I was watching uh, QB1, a documentary on high school quarterbacks, and uh, I really started to like Jake Fromm, who was the quarterback of the Georgia Bulldogs. And I just had to have my wife hit me and remind me, no, 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 no. You're a Gator fan. You don't like Georgia quarterbacks. You need to stop that right now. Uh, but I, I, we forget that we're not from here. We're from somewhere else. I was born in Baltimore, and so I'm an Orioles fan, uh, which is sad. Just pray for me in my soul, but uh, we've, the Orioles have been playing the Atlanta Braves this weekend, and I'll be honest with you, uh, I don't know who to cheer for at this point. I've been in Georgia so long, I don't know who to, I really like the Braves now. But as we, as we live in this world as exiles, we're tempted to fall into uh, this world's way of thinking, and this whole letter is about stepping away from that, particularly in the midst of uh, suffering. So let's start at verse 22. You're gonna see some imperatives. When I say imperative, I mean direct commands of what to do. And you're gonna, we're gonna see this. Peter is building to something. And often as, I think as Christians, maybe more so as Americans, uh, we skip a lot of steps to be more efficient. And it happens in the church too. And, and therefore, when we get to the end, we have no groundedness, no rootedness for what it is that we believe. So let's start in verse 22. And I wanna walk back through what Peter is saying. Verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, and then here's the imperative, here's the command, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since or because you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. A lot is here. We're gonna dig into this more Wednesday night in our sermon discussion. If you wanna be a part of that, I have to cover only 45 minutes worth of stuff today. So look at this imperative back in verse 22, and he says, love one another earnestly. Now, that's where we begin. For a lot of us as Christians, we think we should love each other earnestly. We should love each other, all the one another's in scripture, and, and we jump right in there. Now, the past 18 months uh, has been a litmus test for us of loving one another earnestly. How are we doing? Has that gone well for you? Have you been able to love one another earnestly, whether or not they wear masks or not? Has that gone well for you? Have you been able to love the Henry County School Administration earnestly? Have you been able to do that? Have you loved the other political party earnestly? Have you loved uh, the current president or former president 
earnestly. Has that gone well for you? Based on what I hear, it hasn't gone well for many of us. We begin with love each other earnestly, but we have no foundation. So that's good, like in the honeymoon phase, that's good. We'll love each other, we'll put up with stuff, and we'll just forgive and forgive, but the longer that goes on, the earnestness of our love falls off, doesn't it? Which is why he builds this on top of something else. Go back to verse 17. He says, and Peter says, and if you call on him as father, God, father, who judges impartially, we have a father who judges, whole other sermon, according to each one's deed, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of exile. If there's anything that we have lost in our culture today, it's reverent fear of authority. And it begins with Christians who have lost the reverent fear of God. Can't blame the world for acting like the world. But we are to live, conduct ourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Throughout the entire exile, throughout being in this world but not of it, we are to conduct ourselves with fear. There's no half time. There's no break from it. There's no, uh, there's no excuses. This is it. This is throughout the time of our exile, we are to conduct ourselves with fear. Why? Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. You were ransomed. You were bought back from the futility of the world. Now, this idea of feudal ways is not evil ways. It's just futile. It's just things that don't add up, that don't matter, that don't mean in the scope of eternity. Think about all of the leadership books that are out there today. They are futile if they're not founded on the word of God. They're futile. Money management, uh, parenting, marriage, it's futile ways. Good things, but they are futile because they've been inherited from our forefathers. But we've been bought back, verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. In other words, this isn't plan B. This has been plan A from the beginning. From the foundation of the world, but was made manifest, he was revealed in the last times for the sake of you, readers, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your hope, faith and hope are in God. Okay, so if we are to love one another earnestly, that is built on this foundation of fearing God, of living a life of reverent respect of God. You wanna know why you haven't loved earnestly throughout the past 18 months? Because we've lost the reverent fear of God. That's why. Because if we really wanted to please God, if we really believe that he is who he says that he is, earnest love of our neighbor would be cake for us. It'd be so easy. But the reason we haven't done that is because we haven't planted our roots in the reverent awe and respect and fear of God. But again, we can't just go there. Let's keep going backwards. Look at verses 14. As obedient children, which by the way, they do exist. They're like unicorns, but they do. Apparently they do. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Holy, we read that and we think perfect or we think holier than thou. The word holy in the New Testament actually means set apart or altogether separate. When we just sang holy, holy, holy as the Lord God Almighty, what we're saying is that God is altogether different from you and me. He's altogether separate. He's altogether different from evil. There's no evil that rests in him. He's altogether separate. As he who has called you is holy, then we are called to be holy. We are called then to be set apart, to be altogether separate. And then Paul says, in all your conduct. Now, this word all in the Greek, is, um, it means all, all of it. Like, it, there's no gray area. We are to be holy in all of our conduct. Well, surely Peter didn't, Peter, Peter has never met my spouse. If he knew my spouse, he'd understand how hard it is to be holy in all my conduct. No, 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 all your conduct. Well, surely Peter has never gone through what we've gone through with a pandemic. Okay, Peter would be crucified upside down. All your, he who called you is holy, then you be holy. You be set apart in all of your conduct, in everything. 
It doesn't mean, well, then you can't say to their face, but you can, you can text it or you can put it on social media. No, no, no. All your conduct. If God is holy, then we are to be holy in all of our conduct. This word conduct speaks of the public life, the going and the coming, the, the back and forth of, of normal life is what he's speaking of. It says in verse 16, it says it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. This is pulled from Leviticus chapter 11, where God instructs his people to be holy, to be set apart, because he is in fact set apart. How do we show the world what God is like? By being set apart. Not by being set above, but by being set apart. So then what do we need to do? How do, we, how do we be holy? How do we set ourselves apart? Leviticus 10, 10 says that we are to uh, separate the holy from the common. The problem for us as Christians, particularly I think in the South, in the Bible Belt, is that the common and the holy have become blurred in our way of thinking. And we've been desensitized to evil because it's common. And we've taken good things and we've made them ultimate things, which is idolatry. We are to separate the holy from the common, distinguish between the holy and the common. What is common to the world should not be common to the church. That is how we are to be holy, to separate or distinguish between the holy and the common, between the unclean and the clean. Now, we're getting closer to the root. So, love one another earnestly. Fear God, be holy. If we're holy, if we're set apart, then we do see God as reverent and we respect him. And in so doing, then we love each other earnestly. But if the tip of the spear, if we're not loving earnestly, then we have to make our way back. And I think we're getting closer to the foundation. Look at verse 13. The end of verse 13, he says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You wanna know why we don't love earnestly and why we don't respect God, why we don't have reverent fear of him and why we haven't set ourselves apart as holy is because we haven't set our hope fully on the revelation of Jesus Christ. We've set part of our hope there, but then we have other parts of hope that are in other places. They're in our spouse, they're in our kids, they're in our finances, they're in the government, they're in a vaccine or not in a vaccine, they're in my choice of whether I wanna wear a mask or not. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you, revealed to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where do we need to place our hope? In the fact that Jesus is coming again. And he's Lord. And he will make all things right. Presidents don't. Governors don't. Doctors don't. God does. Our hope needs to be fully placed on the grace that will be brought to you the revelation of Jesus Christ. But Peter here is subtle in what he's saying. You wanna know why we don't hope fully in Jesus Christ? Well, he tells us at the beginning of verse 13. Therefore, he says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. Some of your translations tell you, it says prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. In the Greek, the language is the assumption that you've already done these things and that's how we place our hope fully in Jesus and the grace that will be revealed when Jesus returns. That, that's what happens. So what he's saying is the understanding is that we have prepared our minds for action and we've been sober-minded. Now I think we're at the root of our issue. Why don't we love each other earnestly? Well, because we don't respect God as God. Why don't we respect God as God? Because we haven't seen him as set apart and therefore ourselves set apart. And why is that? Because we have not set our hope fully on Jesus Christ. And why is that? Because we have not prepared our minds for action. And we're not sober-minded. Because we haven't done that work to get to here. Which is why you will set your hope fully on Jesus for, I don't know, 72 hours? 
You'll do it until Monday morning. I'll do it until this afternoon. Yeah, it's there right now. But when the first thunderclap happens, I'm back to where I was. So let me look at a few of these words. First, he says sober minded. Some of your translations say sober in spirit. So that's the idea, that we are sober. The word sober means to not have excess, is what sober means, no excess. We're not, uh, the pendulum hasn't swung to and fro, there is no excess there. We are to be sober minded. And I love you, but we have not done a good job of being sober minded as the big C church in the world today. We've swung from political party to political party. We've swung from um, social justice cause to social justice cause, and we're gonna fight about all of that. Meanwhile, Peter's saying, just don't go in excess. Be sober-minded. Well, then how are we sober-minded, Peter says, to prepare your minds for action. If you have the King James, it says this. Gird up your, the loins of your mind. Did you know that your mind has loins? I didn't either. The idea here in the Greek, Peter says, gird up the loins. He's a fisherman, right? So he's gonna say it a bit differently. Gird up the loins of your mind. Well, what what does that mean? I'm gonna show you a picture of what it means to gird up your loins. To gird up your loins is this. Uh, men in this culture wore long, flowy robes because it was the hot, arid desert, and every once in a while you'd get a breeze, and it would feel better if you were wearing a long robe, and it would cool you off, and so they would wear these, uh, usually a light kind of a fabric, and it would cool them off, but the problem with that is you can't run in one of these. You can't run in it. You can't uh, go to battle in this. You can't have any sort of action. So you'd have to gird up your loins. You'd have to tuck in the excess. And so they would take the excess. You see the picture. They would take the excess, pull it up, wrap it around, either tuck it into their belt or tie it together, which then creates um, what I believe uh, high school boys are wearing now, which is really short shorts. (laughs) Right? Okay. We call those Daisy Dukes, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> so they've, uh, what Peter is saying is, hey, put on the running shorts of your mind. The phrase that we would use today is to roll up your sleeves, is get ready for work, get ready for action. Peter says, therefore, so based on verses one through 12, you've been chosen by the foreknowledge of God for such a time as this. You've been set apart the finished work of Jesus in which the angels long to look. Because of all of that, then, take the excess of your mind and get ready for action. You wanna know why we don't love earnestly? Because we've got so much excess in our minds, we can't even get there because we live in a fantasy world and we are not ready for action in the real world today. So when Peter says, prepare your minds for action, he says, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, this actually takes us back uh, to the Exodus story. The first mentions of girding up your loins is the 10th plague when God sends the angel of death If they had the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorpost, the angel of death would pass over them. He tells them in the middle of the night, gird up your loins and be ready to go. What God tells the people of Israel in slavery in Egypt is, I'm setting you free. You be ready to follow me. But I think the problem for many of us is, is that God wants to set us free, but we're not ready to go. Because we like the comfort of the long robe, and we'd rather not go to war. We'd rather not fight. We'd rather not engage in what's happening. We'd rather just stay still. Gird up the loins of your mind. Prepare your minds for action. Now, I wanna be bold about what I'm about to say, but 
I wanna encourage us into practical steps with this. Because we don't have time to just sit around in our robes. We don't have time. Are you paying attention? We don't have time. You think the church in Afghanistan is worried about comfort tonight? You think the underground church in China is worried about comfort today? And yet the American church has fallen asleep and we'd rather lay around in our robes than gird up our loins of our minds for action. We have to act, church. It's time. Parents, do you see what your kids are facing today? It's time. I've had conversations this week with four or five couples whose marriages are falling apart. It's time. It's time. Conversations with parents and kids struggling. It's time. And we are so distracted by the excess in the robes of our mind that we aren't ready for action. And the enemy has spent 18 months distracting the church from the mission of God. And it's time to gird up the loins of our mind. 1985, Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. And he says this, that people will come to adore the technologies that undo their capacities to think. 1985. Before dial-up. Before phones you could carry around. Is that true today, church? We've come to adore the technologies that have undone our capacities to think. Why aren't we sober-minded? Why can't we gird up the loins of our mind? Why can't we set our hope fully? Why can't we set ourselves apart? Why can't we view God as holy and, uh, and respect in all? Why can't we love earnestly because of this? Because we've sacrificed the ability to think on the altar of entertainment. time to gird up the loins of our minds. The excess is killing us. The things we are distracted by, the things that we fight over, the people that we have become is excess and it's time to prepare our minds for action. And Peter's calling his people to action. Gird up the loins of your mind. And why the mind? Because in order to uh, act appropriately, we have to think rightly. It's in our minds. It's where it all comes from. Do you know the average American spends two hours and 25 minutes a day on social media? Average. Two hours and 25 minutes. If you're a full-time employee, that's over a quarter of your work day on social media. Studies now are linking social media to depression, anxiety, and divorce. You wanna know why we're not ready for action? Because we'd rather scroll Facebook and TikTok and Instagram, that's why. I love you, but that's why. Because any spare moment you have at a red light, in car line, before bed, when you first wake up, sitting at dinner with your spouse, we'd rather scroll social media. To the point of now, we love our technologies more than we love the ability to think and have a conversation. The enemy is coming for your family and you're too busy trying to get likes on social media. Let's fight, let's fight. If it's not social media, it's news and it's talk radio. You do understand how news works today, don't you? That it has nothing to do with truth? You understand that. And yet we're drawn to it. You wanna know why we're drawn to it? Because we like the angst it creates in our hearts. We like that. We like having something to fight against. We like having something to criticize and rail against. That's why, that's why you check your Twitter feed because you like that feeling of having something to live for, even that something to live for is against somebody else or some other way of thinking, that's why. 
And if it's not the news, then it's HGTV and you live in a fantasy world of what your house would be like if you won the lottery. Or if you just worked a minimum wage job because then you'd have like a million dollars to spend on a house apparently. This is why. We are distracted by the fantasy life and we're neglecting what's right in front of us. We can't gird up the loins of our mind because we like the excess. The excess makes us comfortable. It makes us feel like there's not really a war out there. No, 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 there's a war out there. And we're distracted by our activities. We're distracted by our full calendars. We're distracted by our work. We're distracted by our gym membership. The excess in our lives that's creating comfort is causing us to be paralyzed when it comes to war. And there's a war in the culture and in the world for the souls of your family and your children and your spouse and the leaders of our country. There's a war happening. We'd rather distract ourselves with alcohol or drugs or arguments about legalizing marijuana or, uh, or masks or no masks and vaccines and no vaccines. There's a war for the souls of our children. Let's gird up the loins of our minds. Prepare ourselves for action. Now, if you think I'm being a little too forward about it, let me just tell you what Jesus would say about it. Matthew chapter five, verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It's better for you to pour out the bottle than for your whole marriage to fall apart. It's better for you to cut off social media than for your kids to feel neglected by you. It's better. He continues, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. John Owen, a a Puritan pastor says, you be killing sin or it will be killing you. Well, it's not sin, it's not bad. Is Is it pulling your affection and attention away from Jesus? Then yeah, it's bad. Yeah, it is. It's no longer in the middle of the road, it's crossed over into evil then. Do you not have time to read your Bible because you're spending two hours and 25 minutes on social media? Then yeah, it's become sin. Are you so obsessed with what's happening in the world that you can't have a normal conversation with a person about their life? Then yeah, it's become sin. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. If your phone causes you to sin, get a flip phone. If social media causes you to sin, actually talk to people. Deactivate your accounts. If the bourbon is causing you to sin, throw it away. If Fox News or CNN is causing you to sin, turn it off. You will make it. Kill sin or it will be killing you. The writer of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. There is some weight that is not sin, but we still need to lay it aside. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse two, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, Peter says there are angels looking upon us. Since the saints that have gone on before are over the rails watching and cheering us on, should we not then cut off everything that so easily entangles? Should we not then gird up the loins of our mind? It's time for action, church. It's time. Later in the book, Neil Postman says, I believe I'm not mistaken in saying this, that Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. When it is delivered as easy and amusing, it is another kind of religion altogether. But then Peter gives us some hope in verses 24 through 25. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, 
but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Now, if I were to uh, just give you a clip of a song, like a well-known song, you could probably tell me the chorus of that song. We're not gonna do that, but I bet, you could, I bet, it, could, I bet it would happen. Some of us would get the words wrong. Um, hold me closer, Tony Danza. But other, other than that, we would probably know what song we're talking about. Peter gives a clip here of Isaiah chapter 40 because he wants the people to understand. The word that was preached to them is this in Isaiah chapter 40. Now, Isaiah... Uh, The prophet Isaiah wrote this letter to the people of God who are in exile, Babylon, the Babylon. That's why Peter calls Rome Babylon, the empire. And the first 39 chapters are all about how they've sinned against God and something's coming for them. And then almost immediately when chapter 40 begins, God gives a different word to the prophet Isaiah. And this, I believe, is what Peter wants the readers and us to understand about what's happening. Verse one of Isaiah 40, comfort, he says. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. She has paid for it. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And then we'll skip down to verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let's gird up the loins of our mind today. The Lord is faithful. He will restore and renew our strength. Are you weary from the journey yet? Are you tired of the culture? Are you tired of trying to raise godly kids in this world? Are you trying to, tired of trying to hold your marriage together? Good news. Jesus is coming. Good news. God will renew your strength. Good news. He is not weary or tired. When we grow weary, God does not. So, are you too tired to gird up the loins of your mind? It's no excuse. He'll give you strength for it. And we need it. If you bow your heads, close your eyes. and It's important, I think, that we ponder the word of God before we act on it. As Mallory plays, listen, this altar is open for you. I don't know what the Lord has been doing in your life and what he's been revealing to you. But I know this about me, and I would imagine it's true for you too. There's excess in my heart. There's excess in my mind, things that I'm distracted by, things that I'm running towards that I need to lay down. Because it's time for action. Your marriage is falling apart because the enemy is after you. And your kids are running wild because the enemy is after your family. And the depression and anxiety is looming because the enemy is after your mind. It's time that we prepare our minds for action. It's time to fight. I'm gonna pray for us. As I pray, if you feel compelled to come and have this Ebenezer moment at the altar, you're more than welcome to. Staff and elders will be around ready to pray with you and walk with you. Do not give up. 
Though the war is intimidating, our God is greater. Father, we are tired. It's been a journey. And in our exhaustion and tiredness, God, we're not sure we have the energy to keep fighting. We're not sure we have what it takes to gird up our loins and step into the fray. But God, if we're being honest, it's because we don't wanna give up the comforts we have. We like the excess. We like the feelings we get from the excess, like the feelings we get from the alcohol or from the social media or from the gym or from uh, useless knowledge from YouTube. We, We like that. God, would you give us a hatred for the things that pull us away from you? That we would kill it before it kills us. Pray that you would raise up in us a a courage and an audacity to believe that you are who you say you are and to do what you've called us to do. And may the church take its place as the beacon of hope for the world. In a time such as this, may all of our conduct be pleasing to you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you have no hope. Your hope has been placed in what you can do or what you can achieve or who you can marry or what you can look like and and you've learned that that's leading you nowhere and you're only now worse off than you were when you began. I have good news for you. Jesus wants to rescue people just like you. If you would just admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior, believe that Jesus is that savior, that he paid the debt that you owed God. He paid for it with his death and resurrection you would confess that he is Lord and you would be obedient to him. You would find salvation under his name. And if you're here today and you need to lay things down, you need to gird up your loins. You need to cut away the excess. Do it today. Do not delay. God, we love you. You are better than, you are greater than, you are more powerful than, you are more loving than, you're more compassionate than, and we are in awe of you. Make us a church with prepared minds and sober spirits. In a world that wants to push us to and fro and make us anything but sober-minded, God, remind us of our hope we have in you that it would settle our anxious hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.